All right, hello. Welcome to another episode of the EJV Talk Show. I am very excited for this episode. Today I have the John Rudolph. (laughs) John is a faculty member here at the University of Toronto, also at the Glenn Gould School and the National Youth Orchestra of Canada. He has served as the principal percussionist for the TSO for 20 years, and he has also appeared as a soloist with the Vancouver... Radio Symphony? Uh, CBC Radio, CBC Radio Orchestra. Symphony. Yeah. Right. Uh, but yeah, you know, how are you doing today, John? I'm great, Emil. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, so first, like, big question out of the way. Like, how has it been being retired from the Toronto Symphony? Surprisingly good. I awesome. thought I... Uh, it's gone very well. I've really enjoyed retirement. Um, I miss playing music with the Toronto Symphony. Right. I don't miss going to work, if that makes (laughs) sense, having to get up and have a rigid schedule. Right. I've enjoyed exploring other uh, projects. I've loved going to concerts. Right. I hear things in the audience that I wasn't aware of in the back of the orchestra. Mm. And uh, I love hearing my colleagues, as everybody knows, my daughter's in the Toronto Symphony. Right. uh, my wife and I, my wife Kathleen and I, love going to concerts and seeing Teresa. Right. Um, of course, my friends Charles, Joe, and David in the percussion <laughs> section. And seeing my students play uh, in the section, uh, being hired as extras. Right. So uh, Kathleen and I just traveled to Chicago to hear the TSO. Nice. And that was fun. And um, two of the players were Chris Madigan and Dan Morphy, who studied with me at the, right. at the Glen Gould School and NYO. That's awesome. And so, yeah, I'm very proud to see my students up there. That is very great. Right. Um, I think I want to work a bit chronologically. I usually (laughs) do that in every episode here. Okay. But I usually ask if you could recall, like, what your earliest musical memory would be that music has, like, impacted you. My very earliest musical memory. That you could recall. (laughs) All right. It was... uh, I can think of two. Okay. Probably... The most impactful was seeing a marching band in a small town in Pennsylvania. Okay. My uh, grandfather wasn't alive at at the time. He he passed away when I was six months old. But he was a band leader. Oh, wow. He he led the Eagles Band, it was called, in a small town in the coal country of Pennsylvania, Mahanoy City. And I remember we would visit there in the summers the American holiday of the 4th of July. I I, I don't know how old I was. Probably not that young, seven or eight. Mm -hmm. I wasn't playing music yet. Right. But I remember being inspired by seeing this band come down the street in front of my grandmother's house. She was was still alive. Mm -hmm. And we visited her and to see the band go by, Uh, especially the drum line. Right. The drummers went by and it just really inspired me. The second uh, other memory was in my grandmother's house, sitting in front of the record player, <laughs> and the records in those days were not LPs; they were 78s. Small. Okay. They didn't. But my grandfather had a collection of uh, marches by John Philip Sousa, oh, so wow. I can remember sitting in the living room listening to Sousa marches, and those are the first two musical right. memories that I have. And I assume that your your family. Growing up, like, loved music. Well, they did. My parents were not musicians. Okay. The inspiration came from my aunt, who was a Catholic nun, my mother's sister, Mm -hmm. and she was the director of music at a a small, it was a college at the time, it's now a university, Uh, it's called Immaculata University, it was Immaculata College. Right. And uh, she was head of the music department. And uh, we knew her as Aunt Frances, but as a Catholic nun, they took names, right. and she was Sister Regina Therese. Wow. And uh, everybody loved her, and she was convinced I had musical talent. I was the oldest of my siblings. Okay. Nobody was studying music. Piano lessons were not a thing. And uh, my, my Aunt Frances started to teach us, the family, piano lessons when I was in about grade eight. So I, I came to music rather late wow. in life. 
And it wasn't until high school that I started taking drum lessons. She, Anne Francis, pushed me to be in the band. You should be in the band, Johnny, she said. <laughs> And I thought the quickest way to be in the band would be the quickest. I really love the marching band. I want to get out. And maybe that sounds crazy, <laughs> um, but I really love the marching band. Just kept it stuck over here. I, I right? still remembered that, and I knew the fastest way to get out there was playing drums. And they right. gave me the bass drum. Really? You know, if I played saxophone or something, and I have to learn to play the saxophone before I can <laughs> march, but. With drums, you could, you know, I could keep time. They th they trusted me to do mm -hmm. that, and I started carrying the bass drum. Right. And yes, it was heavy, but I loved that part of it. Right. And uh, we had a concert band as well. But and how how are those experiences like starting playing the drums for you? In I assume, like towards the beginning of high school, right? Yeah, it was at the so, start of my high school. So how would you describe like your a like, personal interest growing in the drums? Yeah. Uh, there. really significantly and it was because of the percussion teacher so the band director at my high school would hire other musicians other professionals to come in and teach so somebody taught percussion somebody taught the woodwinds uh, the, our band director was a, a brass player his name was Donald Reinhardt and brass players will know that name. <laughs> he has a, had a system of playing, and he also developed the plastic mouthpiece, which I don't know if anybody uses it anymore, but they did. It was helpful out on the field. It wouldn't get cold. But Dr. Reinhardt, well, he, was, he did have a PhD, so we're very fortunate. We had a great uh, band director, and he hired a percussion teacher, and the drum teacher was named Nicholas D'Amico. Okay. He was a graduate of Curtis. Oh, wow. He freelanced in the city of Philadelphia. He played with the Philadelphia Orchestra. He played with the Philadelphia Ballet. And did a lot of any of the shows, Broadway-type shows that would come through Philadelphia. He would play in the pit. Uh, and Nick was, he was very tough, tough but nice. And uh, as a result of him giving me those first, it was, I was incredibly inspired uh, my first lesson was on the cafeteria table. Really? Lessons in the school. It was a Catholic school. We didn't have band during school. It was after school. It was a it was a Not extracurricular a wow. activity. So we had to hang around and um, you know do it like the sports teams were practicing. We right. had band, but it wasn't part of the curriculum. So my first lessons were in the cafeteria. We didn't have practice pads. He gave us sticks, and we just played on tables. <laughs> Honestly. Wow. And uh, I knew pretty quickly I needed to find a practice pad because the, the sticks, my sticks were breaking right. on the hard surface all the time, cracking. But Nick, um, he wouldn't, he really wasn't taking on private, les private students. Okay. But because of my aunt, he said, all right, sister, I'll do it for you. He knew her. Well, yeah. Oh, and wow. He, she, he, he, knew, he knew my aunt because he also taught. Uh, percussion at the college. Oh, wow. So just like I teach here at U of T, he was teaching at Immaculata. Right. So he knew her, and he said, no, I'm too busy playing. I've got these teaching gigs, but I'll take your nephew right. as a student. So I knew the pressure was on. I knew I had to be right. good. And he was your first teacher. Like, he was my first teacher. I was very like formal, fortunate. First formal teacher. And, and that theme was really throughout my training. I, had, I was very fortunate uh, I guess just to say to be in the right place at the right time to have these excellent teachers. Right. And Nick was the first one. And studying with you studied with him throughout your high school. Throughout high school, and he got me ready for university. And kind of this, the the uh, seed was planted. I started to think, well, maybe I can major in music. It probably wasn't until I was grade eleven. Really. That I thought it was maybe possible. And it was really until uh, grade twelve that I really thought, all right, yeah, I'm going to really do this. What, uh, what sparked that decision for you? Ah, <sighs> What sparked that decision? <laughs> I, I think I was just loving playing in the band. We had an excellent, excellent band, uh, Dr. Reinhardt. We also had an orchestra. I played a little in that. Played a little bit in the jazz band. There were better drum set players than me really? in high school, so I didn't get to do a lot of that, but I love playing drums. I right. love playing drum set. Um, but I, I think it you know, it just was a combination of things. There were older uh, graduates of my high school 
who had become music majors, and I saw that. Uh, and so, yeah, it was just a, just a continuing love of music. I'll keep going back to my aunt. She would lend me uh, recordings. She was giving me uh, piano lessons. She would lend me instruments from the college. So we didn't, I didn't own a xylophone, but I was able to bring the xylophone home from the college and practice on that. And two timpani. Right. The way the school was set up, the way her college was set up, is they didn't, they didn't really give a degree in percussion. It was more of a teaching Interesting. institution. Right. So when uh, Mr. D'Amico would teach, it was only one semester out of four. So those oh. other three semesters, for really my last two years in high school and all through college, uh, through my university, I was able to have use of the instruments and bring them home, have them in the basement. Drove my dad crazy. He wouldn't let me play <laughs> timpani when he was home. Uh, I had to do that when he was at work. But so I was very fortunate. And I keep going back to my aunt. I, I mean, she was the one. She kept, she kept thinking that I had talent. Through her, I was able to get a full scholarship at a music school in Washington D.C. called Catholic University. Right. She had, she got her D.M.A. there. I'm sorry. She got her Ph.D. there. Ph.D. in musicology. Wow. And uh, she was actually in uh, residence one of the years, her last year of her doctorate, co coincided with my freshman year. Right. But Amy, they accepted me solely on her really so. uh, recommendation. I, yeah, I, you know, they needed, they had a great graduate department, but they didn't have too many undergrads and they needed undergrads. And uh, I think I was pretty raw for going in, especially, right. you know, if I auditioned for uh, U of T, I wouldn't get in. Really? At, at the level I was then. I, I was going to ask cause about your level of playing at the point, because you kind of follow that trend, even till today, of uh, winds, brass, and percussion players starting in the beginning of high school, right? So how would you kind of describe, if you want to go in a little further, of your personal like how you were playing in your first year? As yeah, a it was pretty basic. I, now really? I, I was also accepted at Temple University, which is a famous music school. Um, famous teacher Charles Owen was the teacher there, and I auditioned for him, and that was through Nick D'Amico's recommendation. And uh, I was accepted at Temple, but I had a full scholarship at Catholic and it was actually cheaper for me, if this makes sense, to go away. It, you know, I lived in, I grew up in Philadelphia. I hadn't said that yet, I guess, <laughs> in this interview. But it was cheaper for me to go to to go live on campus at in Washington than it was to stay home and commute. I would have had to commute right. into the city uh, at Temple. Um, the other place I was accepted was at Villanova University okay. for astronomy. Really. And I, I, I loved, that was my other love. Really? Uh, that was because of my dad. Uh, but I knew my math was, I'd never survive <laughs> in, a, in a science uh, curriculum. So at, at the Catholic University, who did you study with there? I went down there and studied first with Russell Hartenberger. And how, who, how is it? Er, everybody him? knows him from Nexus. There was no Nexus then. Right. <laughs> Uh, Russell was a graduate student. He was in his uh, last two years of getting his master's. So he was still studying, but your teacher? He was my teacher. Wow. He was uh, finishing his, uh, his t time in the Air Force Band. He was in okay. the military, mm -hmm. full-time military. And uh, the United States Air Force Band, each branch of the service had bands stationed in Washington. Mm -hmm. And Russell was in the Air Force. We are, the difference in our ages is not that great. That was, yeah. it, it, about six years. He right. was only about six years. But man, the difference in <laughs> knowledge and really? ability was, the, it was quite a, a, a gap. <laughs> and I was very fortunate to get him as a, as a teacher. He was on the, it's probably too long a story. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. But the, uh, the draw, the, the, I, I, the reason people went to study at Catholic U 
were they were mostly graduate students. They were mostly these guys in the full time military. Uh, Catholic would let you study with anybody. Really? So they had they did have teachers on staff, and Russell was the percussion teacher. But the reason people went there, it, um, they would go study in New York or they'd go to Cleveland. Now Cleveland, uh, or sorry, Catholic would not pay for the transportation or plane fare to go to these places or train fare, but they would pay the teacher. So most of these guys in the Air Force and at the time, or in the Army, in the military, everyone was drafted at, in, in the United States. Wow. So you, there was, what do you, is conscription the word? I forget. But you were, you were required to register for the draft. Some people were lucky enough to get deferments. But the majority of young men, and it was men in those days, mm-hmm. were uh, conscripted into the military. Right. And uh, so these guys were coming out of, when, okay, when I was, just as an example, when I was in the Catholic U Orchestra, I walked in there. A uh, timpanist was a man named Richard Ecton. He was from Juilliard. He was in the Army. Another man who people may know the name Garwood Whaley, who great writer, educator. He was in the Army band. Right. A guy named Al Mert, uh, Gar was from Juilliard. Al Mertz was from Eastman. Uh, he was a longtime freelancer after he got out of the, he was in the Marines. Long, when he got out, he was a longtime freelancer in Washington, mm-hmm. D.C. Uh, Russell was there. He was finishing his, he had to play in the orchestra as part <laughs> of his uh, requirements for his master's. Right. And I caught just the end of Russell. We just played, we played a few concerts together. So those, those, were, the, those were the type, you know, Russell was from Curtis. So Curtis Eastman, Juilliard, you know, I'm, I'm in, in the section with these guys. I right. was out of my league. They were so, they, but they were very kind to me. Right. They were very kind to me and, and nurtured me along. And just to be there in this, I was surprised they let me in the orchestra, <laughs> in the school orchestra, because it was mostly graduate students. And uh, I, anyway, I, would, I think they just, the director was a horn player, his name was Robert Ricks, and I think he wanted to bring in some undergraduates just so there was right. kind of, you know, we, we'd hang around for four years and, and be there. But that was the environment, and, and yeah, Russell was there, and uh, when, oh, I mean, I have too many stories, and all, okay. all, of, my, all of my students listening will, <laughs> will know, oh, John and his stories, but here's another one. I got to school and they said, okay, you're studying with Fred Begun, who's another famous name. He was the timpanist of the National Symphony. So I phoned him up. Hello, Mr. Begun, I'd like to study with you. He said, okay, uh, what does the school pay for lessons? And you have to come to my house. I said, okay, fine. $10 an hour. Yes, $10 a lesson. Wow, well, that's... Uh, well, I charge 15 he said. I said, oh, well, I can't, I don't know where I'd get $5 a week. I, you know, I didn't have a job, you know, so I said, okay. So I went back to the dean and I said, well, Mr. Begun charges too much. And they said, well, study with Russell Hardenberger. Nobody knew who Russell was, but he was the he, then the brilliant musician, fantastic teacher. Nobody at U of T needs to... I don't need to tell anybody here right. what a what a brilliant uh, musician and teacher and just to and everyone will know who knows Russell. Mm-hmm. You walk in a room and it's he comes in the room and it's special. You know you're in the presence of of a a great musician. He doesn't say anything, but just the way he teaches and demonstrated was an incredible uh, inspiration. Right. And um, well, how much? Um, how many undergrad percussionists at the time were like, around you while working? In, in the whole of uh, the Catholic University yeah. School of Music, three percussionists. Three. That's all. What was the culture of like, going to university to study uh, music, but, like, let alone like, percussion, back then? Like, yeah, so I missed the, what you guys have here, the wonderful studio mm-hmm. and uh, 
camaraderie and, you know, the collegial feeling and people, you know, you listen to people and they listen to you. I did not have that because these grad students would leave the campus. They'd come, but they lived somewhere else. You know, they lived in the city, so they weren't hanging around. The good thing for me is I had the run of the place. I could practice whenever I wanted. There were, you know, instruments available and... We rehearsed in an old movie theater wow. in a in an area of Washington called Brookland, which I think is a little better now, but it was dangerous. It was it was not a great area of the city. It was actually off campus a little bit, and we would they would run a bus. Um, later in my time at Catholic, I had a car. My I did have a my dad gave me a car to use. Mm. So I was able to drive back and forth. So I had flexibility to go to this old theater. It was called the Newton Theater. And so the great thing is we had lessons and we practiced on stage. Uh, there were times there were operas and they kicked us out and we'd go to have to be in the music building. Uh, but I, I never had, the best thing was I had plenty of time to practice. Right. So and I was inspired. I, when I saw these guys enough that, oh my God, you know, this is what it takes. And again, many of my students know this story. Uh, one time I had a lesson with Russell in, on stage at the Newton, and he said to me, hang around for the next student. You just, you know, so I could go sit in the audience. He said, just, just sit out there. Okay. So this guy comes in, had a hat on, a military hat. Didn't have a uniform on, but he had this little kind of typical military hat. And I couldn't hear what they were saying. They were speaking quietly, but Russell's on stage with this guy, and this guy starts playing, the student. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, my jaw dropped. I thought, oh, my God. If this is the level of, even, I knew he was a grad student, but still, I thought, I have no business in music. I don't know if I can practice enough to ever be as good as what I'm hearing. It was Bob Becker. Oh, wow. <laughs> Bob was in the Marines, <laughs> taking courses at Catholic, needed the credit of lessons, knew Russell. Yeah, I'll, I'll study with you. So that, this is before Nexus. Right. They, they, hadn't, they were playing together. They were doing some things together, but Nexus had not happened. Right. <laughs> um, by that point, like in your undergrad, like say the beginning to the middle, like what was your view of your end goal? Like of your career? Oh, sure. Yeah. When I started, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to teach public school oh, wow. music. Um, being around all these guys in the military, I was really... And hearing the military bands, uh, there were concerts, and they were all free. I didn't go a lot, but I heard them. Um, I, I would... I, that also was a goal. And I thought, well, maybe I could get into one of the military bands for four years and and get I was in education I was in music education that was my major I wasn't in performance my dad wanted me to get a teaching degree he didn't want me to just he said you'll never get a playing job you should be but you should be a teacher right. you know if you can play on the side fine or a public school teacher you know <laughs> so I was in music ed and uh, I will say one other thing one when I was in grade 12 uh, a friend of mine we went on uh, a trip to Washington and we heard the Marine Band and uh, it was outdoors at 8th and I streets in Washington DC it's the Marine Navy Yard actually and uh, so there was almost like a football field and they uh, they they came they marched toward us and they just did an about face and each each line would turn and go back and man the drums it was so awesome but what I really remember were the trombones Really? And it just, it, it gave, that, that was another big inspiration. I thought, wow, if I could ever play in a, a band like this, right. <laughs> wouldn't that be great? So um, what kind of made the switch of you like doing a master's degree? And I assume that's in performance, right? Well, I was drafted. I was at the right. end of the draft. So I was drafted into the U.S. military. Right. Now, I anticipated this would happen, so I was, uh, I had friends, and <laughs> Russell was, Russell had left by that time, and uh, 
uh, his the the man who came into the Air Force who became a, one of my closest friends is Doug Howard. Went on to become the principal percussionist of the, of the Louisville Symphony, long time with the Dallas Symphony, and teaches at Aspen. He still te he's retired from Dallas. He still teaches at Aspen. Um, but Doug was so. Yeah, Doug came in as a grad student. He was in the Air Force. And I knew there would be an opening in the Air Force. So I, was, I had all, already auditioned before I got my draft notice. Because once you get your draft notice, you don't have any say over where you go. Right. They, also, they can send you anyway, the, anywhere. The Vietnam War was still going on. So that was a possibility. Yeah. I definitely didn't want that. <laughs> the difference is if you audition and are accepted in one of the bands, you must sign on for four years, where if you're drafted, it's only two. So I knew that was happening. And uh, my plan B, I wanted to go to Temple to study, uh, back, back to Philly to Temple to study my master's there. Mm -hmm. But since I was uh, required to go in the military, I enlisted and uh, uh, spent what amounted to three and a half years in the Air Force. So the, all the military bands would pay for a portion of your master's. Oh. Now, you could go anywhere, but Catholic University, they were smart. They made it easy. And, right. you know, no, no degree is easy, but they, they, they were very considerate of the time that the guys in the band... We went on two three-week tours, one in the spring and one in the fall, so we missed three weeks of school. And th so you missed three weeks or two weeks. I guess, was it, I'm, I'm, I, rem I recall three. Somebody hearing this will correct me, one of my old friends. But uh, let's say it was two weeks, so you missed two weeks of classes. That's not good. But the professors, they wanted, they wanted these guys in school. It was good for Catholic U to say, you know, Russell Hartenberger has his degree right. from Catholic U. He has his master's from Catholic U. Um, your time, how would you describe your time in the military, like, in terms of, like, your musical growth? Like, do you th did you, well, would you it, say there was a lot of, like, it was, development there? Yes, it was huge. Played a ton of notes. Yeah. That. And now, which I, the experience I did not have in university, I had in the band. I had great players. And uh, when I started, Doug Howard, who was, I keep going back to Doug, but he was a huge influence. And by the way, anybody listening to this, Doug is coming to Toronto. He's going to give a master class at the uh, Glen Gould School on April 14th. So I'll be sure to invite everybody from U of T. Uh, but Doug, Doug is, you know, words fail to really describe what a great musician. We roomed together. We lived together for two years wow. as, as well. And, uh, yeah, we practiced together. We, you know, we practiced at the same time. We'd play duets. We used to play duets on tour. But, it, okay, to answer your question, yes, to be around great musicians and to play great music, I was fortunate. We played a lot of transcriptions. The harpist, yes, we had a harpist in the... Air Force Band, concert band, was a fine arranger. His name was Lawrence Odom. He arranged the Pines of Rome, oh, the whole Roman trilogy, the Fountains of Rome and Roman festivals for band. He, he uh, arranged Daphnis and Chloe. He arranged the Suite from Rosen Cavalier. Wow. So I, and as a favor to the percussionists, the, uh, the wind players hated it. Larry didn't change the key. So you know a lot of band transcriptions, they'll put it in B right. flat. I, there's a famous uh, Porgy and Bess right. that's in B flat. Larry, it was in the original key. So when I learned the, say, the Glock part from Daphnis uh, or Pines of Rome, it was in the original key. <laughs> and so that, that, that was a great experience. I played a ton of notes. Um, and I, you know, I have friends that I keep in touch with to this day. That was the other thing. Uh, I, I love the experience. We were fortunate to have a good conductor. His name was Arnold Gabriel, still alive. Wow. He's, uh, he was just a fine musician, and he had an ear for uh, 
programming these pieces. And he had, he wasn't, I wouldn't call him a tyrant, but he got the best out of the band. Mm -hmm. And there was a limited repertoire. We, we would in, introduce uh, new pieces, like if Larry would come up with, a, with an arrangement. But the band had the things they played really well, and they wouldn't rehearse them. And so the new guy coming in, mm -hmm. with yeah, I really had to bump, maybe I had one rehearsal on variations on a Korean folk song or something, you know. And uh, they, they, so I really had to up my game that way. Right. And we, we went through a lot of music. I really had to learn, I was thrown on the mallets pretty much. Doug was playing timpani. Um, another wonderful man, John Richardson, was playing snare drum. I was given mallets in my first years. Uh, so I learned to read really quickly. And and be able to not, uh, you know, take a take learn a piece quickly. Right. So coming out of the military, like where were you kind of at in your life there? Well, okay. So then my focus changed. I thought, well, okay, now I can. I think I can be a performer. Yeah. I did have my music education degree, so I started looking at orchestra auditions. Okay. And make a long another long story short, uh, <laughs> Vancouver was open. Right. So, and it was working toward the end of my enlistment. So it, the timing was good, and I auditioned in one principal percussion right. in the Vancouver Symphony. So we moved to Vancouver. Did you? When did you do your master's degree? During oh. the time I was in the military. I see. So that's okay. how it worked, and that's so. It, I didn't do it. You know, in two years took me maybe three. So you, we would rehearse in the morning. Mm -hmm. Go to class at Catholic U in the afternoon. Maybe, maybe if there was a concert at night, mm -hmm. you know. But they were, the Air Force was extremely. Um, uh, they they just they made it possible. Right. They did. They just made it possible for us to get our 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 time in. To, they didn't make us really have to come back to the barracks and you know paint the barracks or something they we had the afternoon off right and we were able to, and that's when we were able to go to school and again between the air force and catholic and the military paid for mm -hmm. they paid for 75 percent of the tuition so you know my first year i didn't want to go back to school so i didn't but by my second time second year in the in the military i thought this is stupid they're going to pay <laughs> for it and i've just got to go back and get my master's right was that when you so worked? it was part-time was that when you worked with Alan Abel? Or yes, when? yes, that, that's, <laughs> that also happened. Uh, through Russell, I was able to start taking lessons with Alan Abel, so I would drive up from Washington to Philadelphia for lessons that's, with Abel. That's not close. What no, it, it, right. and I didn't go every week. Right. I mean, I would go, usually he was, again, these people were just so accommodating. Right. Um, he would teach me whenever I could get home. And so I'd go home for thanks. The American Thanksgiving was a long weekend. And I'm sure he had, the, he had family functions, but <laughs> he would teach. We, I'd go to his house, go down to his basement over Christmas break. I'm sure he had better things to do <laughs> than teach me, but he made time. It wasn't just me. He made time for all the students. Any able student will tell you, you felt <laughs> You felt unique. You felt very special. Um, he he made it wasn't just me that he that he did this for. Right. But so that was my time. And usually in the summers, depending what I was doing in the summers, um, even in university, I started with him in 1970. So I was it was my second year in the my third year, starting my third year at uh, at Catholic, and it was after Russell left. I, t right. I stayed with Russell for two years. And how how was that shift? Of working with Russell and Alan, like that's well, it was very similar. Yeah, their yeah. approach was the same. So Abel wasn't my main teacher at Catholic right. at the time. Then I I moved to uh, the principal percussionist in the National Symphony. His name was Tony Ames. I, I yeah can't say enough. So Tony and Tony, he was fine. You want to go study with take some lessons with Abel, sure. But every week I'd have lessons with Tony Ames. He was my main teacher then for my last two years. Right. So I was kind of studying on the side with, if that makes sense. I see, I see, I see. With Al. But, um, yeah, so you, you won the principal job at Vancouver Symphony. How was, like, would you say out of the military already, you were, like, 
fiery, like, I'm going to win these auditions. Yeah, yeah, I thought that. Right. I thought that. I was fortunate to win that one. And uh, going to Vancouver, I'd say the biggest thing was finesse. I had to learn to play quiet. So really? maybe it was even playing quiet in the band wasn't like playing quiet in the orchestra. So I'd, I'd say that was the biggest challenge. To I'd, I could play a ton of notes, but to get the right the right sounds for the orchestra. I mean, I, you know, my teachers had told me, but you don't know it until you experience it. Right. How would you How would you describe your time there, Vancouver? Vancouver was fabulous. I, I <laughs> it's, it's yeah. I, suffice to say. Uh, we had a wonderful life there. It's a wonderful place to raise children. Our two children were born there. I had fabulous colleagues in the Vancouver Symphony. Um, just And friendships that last to this day. Uh, we have great friends in Toronto, but nothing really, you know, the bond that we that we had with our friends in Vancouver is you kind of, you know, you're adults, of course, young parents and everything, but you... Uh, you grew up in a way with these people, mm-hmm. if I can say that. I mean, we were all, you know, what I'm saying. As as young, young parents and young musicians in the Vancouver Symphony, the year I joined, there were 13 other new players. So a lot of people coming in. Uh, it was just people retiring. Right. And uh, so that that yeah, it was it was wonderful. I can't say enough. And I had wonderful students, as I do here at U of T. But that was your first like major teaching. Oh, absolutely! University they experience. hired me to teach. Well, well it was a, a student, a man named Bruce Wrigley, who uh, ended up winning principal percussion in the Hong Kong Philharmonic. Uh, he's actually a financial advisor now. Oh, wow. Victoria moved on from music. He studied in Manhattan with Fred Hinger after I taught him at UBC. But he went. I taught him in high school. He was a high school student. And he went to the administration at UBC and said, I want to study with John, so they hired me, thanks to Bruce. Right. And how, how long were you at Vancouver for? 21 years. Wow. Oh, wow, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. I did not... And at the time, I, my wife, after we were there three years, she won the piccolo job, so right. I was playing in the orchestra with my wife, and we both played in the CBC Vancouver Orchestra. She was principal flute in that, and I was principal percussion. Right. And at the end of our time in Vancouver, our daughter Teresa uh, plays the violin. Uh, was playing the violin, <laughs> switched to the viola. She was in high school. She was hired as an extra. So the three of us played together. That early on. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. So moving from Vancouver to here, like. How how was that for you? You 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 took the you took N one the TSO principal percussion audition. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up. A lot of right. people will say, "How could you leave the beauty of Vancouver?" Right. But it you know the Toronto Symphony is special, special. In the, we always knew it. We heard them on tour when they would come out west, and the opportunity to join this great orchestra. How, how would you just des- something I couldn't pass up? How would you describe like your your like work going into like taking that audition? Because that's like a huge audition in this. In yes, itself. it is. I was very fortunate. They had been having auditions for principal percussion. They weren't hiring anybody mm-hmm. um, for one reason or another. So I, again, I said at the beginning, I came along at the right place at the right time. They were looking for somebody with experience. I had that. I was in my late 40s. Well, I was 46. Uh, and they did not require me to play an audition um, really? against 100 other people. Right. So they, I was hired to play the three tenors, which uh, you know, people know that now. It's 25 years ago. But um, that, that was put together by David Kent, the timpanist. Right. And it was a combination of Vancouver, mostly Toronto musicians, but some Vancouver, because we played gigs in Vancouver and one one show in Vancouver and one in Toronto. Right. So then he said, uh, David, uh, David Ken, I owe it to David Ken. He said, this job's open. Are you interested? So I played three trial weeks and uh, they said, OK, come back if you're we're interested, if you are. So I went back in, I think it was March. This would have been 1997. And I played, uh, we recorded some, I, I played a week, and then as part of that week, the main 
piece of repertoire was Nielsen's Symphony Number no. Five with the great snare drum part. Right. And uh, as part of that week, I played an audition, but the audition was excerpts with the orchestra. It's called a with orchestra audition. So at the end of one rehearsal, they stopped at noon and passed out the music, and I just went from instrument to instrument with the orchestra. So it was really a great way to audition. Right. So I just played Porgy and Bess with the con you know conductor in the orchestra. Okay, stop, go to Glock, did Sorcerers. Um, I played some timpani. There was the part of the job was playing a part of the assistant timpani book, so I had to do that. Uh, played some vibraphone, snare. I didn't play a lot of snare drum because I think they felt like they'd heard enough <laughs> in the Nielsen. Again, you know, I was very fortunate. But that was my audition. Right. So I didn't have to go in to uh, play against a hundred other people. Um, from there, like, well, not from there actually, but <laughs> I'd say that from from what from Just, our. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm good. making sure I still have juice. Yeah, don't my, worry. Charge on my phone. <laughs> but um. Yeah, you, you seem to, like, let the music take you wherever, like, like work will, like, have you, right? But what, what was that like? Like, you know, you were in Vancouver and you had a, a family making that move to Toronto. Like, it was very hard. I'd say it was hardest on my wife because she had a full-time position in the Vancouver mm -hmm. Symphony. Moving to Toronto, she didn't have a full time position in the TSO. Right. So that was the she made the biggest sacrifice. Right. But I think it was uh, it was best for everybody else, and that, you know we're forever. She Kathleen has made a fabulous career here, playing as a soloist, chamber musician, as a teacher. She coordinates the woodwinds, the woodwind department at the Glen Gould School. Uh, yeah, coaching chamber music, playing chamber music. Um, and freelancing, playing in various orchestras. Right. When we moved here, she continued to play in the CBC Vancouver Orchestra. So mm. she would fly back and do a gig, you know, for a week, stay with friends, and, you know, then come back to Toronto. Uh, but the, we lived in Toronto. So, yeah, that was, that was the biggest... Um, I think sacrifice came from Kathleen... Mm -hmm. Uh, Teresa at the time was studying at the Cleveland Institute of Music, so it it was a move for her. But you know she was in school in Cleveland, right. and our son Mike was in high school. Oh wow! So he had he that was a big change for him. He came to uh, Toronto. His first year was at Northern Secondary, and then uh, his last two years, Mike, correct me, so <laughs> two or three, but uh, at the Etobicoke School of the Arts. Was he? He's not a professional musician. No, now, but he but. did play. He was a he's a talented musician. He played in high school. Played clarinet in high school. Really? Yeah, but musical theater, and right. uh, well, I shouldn't say musical theater. He was in theater in the theater right. department at ESA. What? Like, was it kind of your goal? Like, my my children are going to be playing music. Like, well, we wanted to give them the exposure. We wanted right. to give them the chance. Uh, Teresa, they both started Suzuki violin. Teresa was three. I think Michael, Mike might have been four. But we gave them the opportunity. And uh, with Teresa, it was obvious that was her calling. And uh, she loved it from the beginning. Mike, it was, you know, he liked it, but it wasn't his thing. And we, we could see that. Right. And we didn't force him to go any... Uh, they both took piano lessons... And we just expose them to music, right. but I think seeing their, both their parents and knowing the lifestyle and <laughs> hearing us complain at the dinner table of <laughs> whatever <laughs> politics are going on in the orchestra, you know, it was a huge part of their life. Right. Uh, Teresa, Teresa tells the story. She was in elementary school and she... Uh, she was meeting friends, and she said to somebody, "Oh, you know, she's probably in grade one or two. And she said, "What, what is your, what are your, what, which, what instrument do your parents play?" Because all of our friends were in the orchestra. Right. She knew all the orchestra kids. She <laughs> thought everybody's parent played music. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. we just we gave them the chance, uh, and uh, Teresa did become a professional musician. Right. Yeah. When did you start teaching at the Glen Gould School and here? Was it Early on at the Glen Gould, um, the uh, dean at the time, Rennie Regeer, hired me. We knew Rennie. 
Kathleen and I from uh, a music camp on Vancouver Island, the Courtney Youth Music Center. And uh, uh, so Rennie knew us when we got to town, and he hired us both. I started there before I started at uh, U of T. And Russell brought me to U of T, mainly along with, uh, I think Beverly had been teaching at the time, but we were mainly to fill in when he was on tour with Nexus. Really? And then it, so what, I taught maybe every student three lessons a semester, (laughs) and then it just kind of grew from there. Um, Russell went on to be dean, (laughs) you know, he's head of graduate studies as well, he was dean of the faculty of music, so he was teaching less and less, and uh, so Beverly and I were teaching more and more, but that's how it started. Did you did you like initially like love Toronto right away when you when you got here? I would say yes. I I I do. I know you know. And again, people will say, "What Vancouver? The mountains and the water?" <laughs> no, I love Toronto. I love the percussion tradition here. Nexus, Russell, you know, the fine uh, David Kent, and my other colleagues in the TSO at the time, Dan Ruddick and Don Kewen, Pat Kruger. I I was inspired by them. And I'm inspired by the orchestra, inspired by my colleagues. They, yes. And I loved the, the vibe in Toronto right. that was, um, it was a little more laid back, West Coast, you know. But here it's, it's just more what I was used to growing up in Philadelphia and studying in Washington. And the other great thing was I was closer to my family. Um, still, you know, not close, that close, but close, Toronto's closer to Philly than... Uh, Vancouver is to Philly, so. <laughs> right. So, but no, I loved I loved everything about. It. I loved the city. I loved the art, all the culture. Um, being able to hear so many great musicians would come through, mm-hmm. and uh, just the whole feeling here, the whole vibe. Yeah. Right. I'm gonna start wrapping this up, but uh, finally, yeah. <laughs> I think we've gone on long yeah. enough. You but, might have some editing to do. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't edit much on this. I don't have much time. But <laughs> okay. I usually just put them up in full. Oh boy! But <laughs> but um, I just want to ask, like, if there are any like final little stories you want to tell since being in Toronto, or anything you missed from the past that you want to just share. I, you know, should, we all have regrets. But I, I think having retired, I look back on all the good times yeah. and, uh, you know, treasure my family, my, my children, my, my grandchildren, uh, my wife and I love um, caring for the, for the grandkids. And I, uh, I just, I think of the positives. I love coming here to inspire students. That still really is a passion of mine. Uh, I love sharing my knowledge. I guess my regret is the students I taught at UBC, I wish I knew what I know now. Right. <laughs> I would have been a better teacher. Uh, but I'm still learning. No, I, I, it's, it's just enjoy every day. It's a gift. It's a blessing. Uh, I try to do that and, and stay positive, live in the moment. And you can, uh, nothing's impossible. Work hard, uh, have a dream, live your dream, do what you love. That, that's my message. Well, you, you heard it here. This is John Rudolph <laughs> on the EJV Talk Show. This has been delightful talking to you, John. It's also like a pleasure working with you this year, last year, and going forward. And thank you again for doing this with me. Oh, it's my the pleasure, <laughs> Emil. Thank you for asking. But yeah. <laughs> We've gone on a long time. You're, yeah. you're very kind. Uh, no, I, yeah, I love working with you as well. Uh, thank you. Well, yes, uh, thank you guys for watching. Thank you. Okay.